I'm keen to get an insight into what this whole Olympic model is. There's so many bodies, there's so many different parts. Um, I guess us as consumers traditionally just see the end product, the mm-hmm. summer or winter Olympics. If we start with the IOC, yes. what do they do? <laughs> well, the IOC essentially run the Olympic Games. That's that's the that's that's the event. Yeah, but now they've got you know summer win, summer games, winter games, youth summer games, youth winter games. So um, and they're involved in a few other of the smaller games as well. But essentially, they run the Olympic Games. And you know, in the Olympic Charter, it's you know bringing the world to it's sport at, for the benefit of humankind. Mm. So bring everyone into the village, you know, at the moment, gee whiz, yeah, like now is a perfect time for it to bring everyone together. You know, every race, every color, every creed in the village, all, all because of sport and all getting along. There's no issues in the village whatsoever. You know, you've got um, Palestinians alongside Israelis. You've got Muslims and Christians all together. And because of sport, uh, there's no issues. So that's the example that the Olympic movement is trying to, put across to say, hey, you know, if you've got a purpose or a reason to bring everyone together, that's a fantastic example for humankind. So that's the, the outset. So, so for that to occur, you need every country to be there, to be represented. Everyone that participates. Half, yeah, if there's only half the countries, then it's not an Olympic Games. So, so that's where this whole, the, you know, the funding starts to become important because the IOC generates a lot of revenue, but more than 90% of that revenue, so it generates on uh, $5 billion of revenue over a four year period through television rights and sponsorship. But 90% of that goes back to sport in three different ways. One, it goes back to sport via supporting the host city. So Tokyo, for example, this year, you know, they receive a lot of funding from the IOC to help them run the games. National Olympic committees receive a lot of funding. So that funding goes down to Australia, for example, and helps us, helps Australia fund the teams. And the other aspect is that it goes to the third part, it goes to the international sporting federations. So the, you know, I, the um, ICU for cycling, FISA for rowing, you know, FINA for swimming, it, it funds or it helps to fund a lot of those sports as well. So by generating the revenue at the top level and feeding that down, you're helping out the hosts for Olympic Games, you're helping out the countries to get their athletes there and you're helping out the sports to actually run sport. And um, it's, in, it's surprising how many countries, like it's more than 50% of countries rely 100% on IOC funding to support their local um, sport. How's, how's that distributed country to country? Uh, well, there's a, a division within the IOC that it's called, it's called the, so, the funding model is called Olympic Solidarity. Mm. So every, trying to put everyone, it's hard, you know, because you've got the US and some, you know, poorer countries, it's a very big difference. But it's, it's trying to give everyone the opportunity to attend the Games. And the team there, you know, they're, con- you know it is a, definitely a needs basis to help develop grassroots sport, but also provide pathways and then the elite program as well. But it's, it's so hard, like there's just, there's, there's never enough money to go around. Um, and as I said at the outset, unless you've got every country, there are all 207 National Olympic Committees represented at the Olympic Games. It's not an Olympic Games. So that funding is super important to get half those countries to the Games and have athletes at the Games to to um, yeah, make it all happen. Is that funding growing? It has been. It will be interesting over the next few years to see how it plays out, but it's pro- primarily underpinned by uh, the television rights. Yeah, that's the big hunk. 
Yeah, that's a bit, yeah, absolutely. And the and the top and and then they've got um, you know sponsors. They call them the top sponsors. That are essentially they take a category. So a car manufacturer takes all of automotive. Um, Alibaba does the the um, essentially. Yeah, it would be Alibaba or Amazon essentially, but they take that category. Yeah. Johnson and Johnson for uh, for pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And then health, you know, body load, body products and, and whatnot. So uh, Bridgestone for tyres essentially. So these sponsors pay a lot of money to to be the only one in that category. Yeah. And so funneling down to the Australian level, so the AOC is funded yes. by the IOC. It's partially funded by the IOC, yeah. yeah. And the rest from the government or from private no. sponsors? No, that's the thing, Alex. The people, th yeah, it's the, the AOC receives no funding from the government. So, and, and that's where, yeah, that's where it's confusing. So, ah. <laughs> so the AOC receives a, little bit, a bit of money from the IOC, which is great. Um, and because it's part of the IOC's role to develop sport around the world. The AOC takes that. It, the, a, a, the Australian Olympic Committee also has a whole bunch of sponsors and they can on-sell television rights to you know, typically Channel 7. Um, and that funds the team. So it's important that, and I know, you know John Coates, the president and the board are really, the big emphasis is to remain independent of government. So if you've got, if, yeah, it's just that autonomous, that autonomous nature of, uh, of being able to make your own decisions. So fortunately, uh, there was after the Sydney Olympics, there was also a foundation that was built um, or secured, ninety million dollars, which is now about one hundred and fifty million dollars, and the distributions out of that fund can will fund um, future Olympic teams as well. So sponsors and the foundation, the Olympic Founda Australian Olympic Foundation fund the team. Yeah. And what, what, what kind of decisions can you, like back to the being independent part, what, have you got an example of the kind of decisions you can make because you are individual, you're not associated with the government? Yeah, well, a classic example uh, might be a bit before your time, Alex, but the um, 1980 Moscow Olympics, the Australian government wanted to boycott. And you don't want to, you know, you don't want, it's hard to separate, but you don't want sport to be a political football, so to speak. And the ASE said, no, they, were, they had the ability to say, no, we're going to go, we're going to send athletes. We've had athletes trained for all of these years. They've got no interest in a cold war between um, the US and Russia. We're going to the game. So, we're, that's a that's a classic example of that autonomy of not having to of being able to say no to a government. No, we're going to do our own thing. Yeah, and so the AOC, what do they do? They they get the teams together. So cycling, okay, your sport. Yeah. Uh, runs their selection trials. Chooses the team. And the team is submitted to the AOC. And the AOC says, yep, fantastic. Well done, Cycling Australia. You've got a great team. They're now part of the Olympic team. And from then on, essentially, the, the AOC takes those athletes, um, clothes them, gets them over to Tokyo, gets them through the village, gives them um, support along the way, brings them home, and big celebrations gold medals and gold lots of gold medals lots of medals lots of pbs uh so that's that's so the aac take the uh, the summer team mm -hmm. take the winter team the two youth games that i mentioned before the the um, youth winter games and the youth summer games and there's also the pacific games in oceania so in you know, Papua New Guinea or Fiji or Samoa, wherever they're held. And there's all these other, there's all these other world games as well. So it's actually becoming really difficult. There's, um, so there's the sort of the four Olymp Olympics 
summer winter, youth summer winter, and a bunch of other games that the AOC sends teams to. And that's all um, very costly. Yeah. So, um, so is, and using cycling as an example, um, Cycling Australia, their Olympic funding, do they get any money from the AOC? They will get a little bit of support. The, the athletes will get some support. The successful athletes will get a, a, um, a medal incentive program and some, uh, some funding that way. But the majority, well, yeah, the, the majority of funding comes from the Sports Commission, or it's called Sport Australia now. Yeah. So uh, you've got two bodies, AAC, they just do the Olympic Games and the Sports Commission that funds cycling for throughout the year and throughout years as well. And the key and that's the government, and that's government funding. So government yeah. pumping money into um, what's called Sport Australia now. And then Sport Australia distributes down to swimming, to cycling, to gymnastics, to rowing, sailing, you name it. And this is the other John. And that's the other John. So you've got John Cates here and John Wiley here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. It's, 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 it's complicated. It's, well, yeah. it's, it's not complicated. It's just that um, unless you get, it's explained to you, it's, uh, it's difficult to understand how there can be two, two different bodies. And do you think it works? It's focusing on Australia. So the two bodies, the two, um, the Sports Commission and the AOC. Do you think it works? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, the AOC doesn't have the funds to um, support sport across the board. I mean, it, it is a model. And I think it works here because, um, because of that, you know, we don't have to... There is that autonomous nature. We can make our own decisions and we can take the yeah for example that boycott i used you can take the high moral ground and say no that is not right we're going to do the right thing we're not going to become political and get embroiled in all of that we're going to do the right thing for the athletes so i think that's really really important and then you allow the government via sport australia to 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 help fund um the sport on an ongoing basis yeah that's one model the us on the other hand the US Olympic Committee does both roles essentially, which is a massive, massive job, as you can imagine. And does that come with extra risk? Yeah. Yeah. Have, you, has, have we seen that play out at all? Um, well, I think the scale has, uh, you know, it's just hard to. And the, well, the US is interesting because they don't get any funding from the government either. <laughs> so, at all? No, not at all. The entire no, thing's bizarrely, bizarrely. privately funded. Pretty much. They get a big slice of the television rights because a lot of the US, well, it's a US company that's paying. So they get a, a big slice of that from the IOC. Um, but yeah, it's all, uh, it's all yeah, fundraising, revenue raising. Hmm. What do you... What are your thoughts on John Wiley's winning edge strategy? Is that where by that you mean the uh, appointing of um, business people into board roles? Well, there's pl- plenty of plenty of ways this question could go. I'm, I'm thinking just <laughs> from a, from a medal pers- from an athlete perspective. So you were in the system pre the winning edge. Mm-hmm. I was in the system when it first got rolled out and road cycling still had a little bit of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how, how do you think it's played out? The implementation of it, the difference between now and when you were there? Well, I think when I was fortunate in that a lot of my career was leading up to Sydney and then, you know, a couple of games after Sydney. And so there was a, there was a, Funding, there was quite a lot of funding. So the government, it was, sport was far better funded then than it is now. So more funding, it can be spread more evenly across more sports. 
the Winning Edge program was targeting, or you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Winning Edge program was targeting those sports that would deliver medals and fund those more than, much more than other sports. So that's great if, if all you want is medal tally. Uh, but if you want participation and you want the growth of other sports that are really you know, struggling, that are non-professional, the smaller Olympic sports, you know, they need help. And uh, in fact, the AOC actually funded, you know, helped fund some of those uh, smaller sports as well with some, you know, made some critical decisions and divert some funding to those sports just to help out a little bit. So, um, did it work? Well, it depends what outcome you want. If you want those sports to grow, the sports that are being funded to provide the medals, then yes, but it, probably not if you want a broader base of sport. Hmm. You know, I don't think uh, modern pentathlon got in, got very little funding, and yet Chloe Esposito won over in Rio, you know, gold medal. So despite that, uh, we can still do, still get some decent results, but um, I'm not sure, even after that result, they're still not getting much funding. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. But is that the reality now that we're not leading up to Sydney? We don't have that big pot of gold that seemed to be distributed yeah. through yeah, the well, glory it's just days. A constant, you know, it's a constant struggle, this funding funny well and, and sports need to stand up on their own you know more and they need to stand up on their own two feet more than what they've done in the past there's no doubt it can't be just waiting for handouts you know they've got to be start to think more cleverly and think of new ways of of generating funds but you still need that basic funding model from the government and you know and you and i know the linkage between Health, a healthy society is far less a drain on the medical system going forward and, and mental health issues, um, physical health issues, community issues. If you've got more, you know, I'm sure you've noticed, you know, with sport stopped during this COVID period, you just realise how much of the community comes together. Whether you're going to watch the professional leagues as a spectator, whether you're participating yourself, whether your kids are out doing sport on the weekends, which brings all of the parents and other family members together, like sport is such a massive part of the community. And it's not just at the elite level, it's funding that should go to all of those lower levels to get more people out on their bikes, cycling in organized fashion, to get more people on the water rowing, running, playing tennis, you know, everything. The more people we've got active, the better it is for, for society, I think. And it's just been a huge struggle for the government to, yeah, as we know, governments are very short-sighted. They're just concerned about getting re-elected. They're not overly concerned about what Australia is going to look like in the next 25 years. Mm. And does that result in a sporting funding model that's way too heavily skewed to the top? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, I say I laugh when I answer that because if you change that model, you destroy the top because mm. <laughs> so, there's so little. Uh, but yeah, ideally, you know, and we've been talking, you know, we've got the future fund in Australia. Why not have a, you know, carve out part of that and put it into a, um, a sport fund, have three or four billion dollars in a foundation that the returns from that foundation then support sport. Yeah, and therefore it's not a, not a handout every time. You've actually got a capital there and the, the returns that it generates gets fed into sport. I mean, there's, so, there's a lot of different ways to think about it rather than just writing a check every year to the Sports Commission. Yeah. So we've got to get smarter about this and not only continue funding the elite level, but filtering down to the grass you know, to grassroots mm. so do you think it's a change in the way that ca there's in the cash isn't given all to the sports commission or is it a change in the sports commission's mandate or what where, where does the change need to occur 
Well, the change needs to, well, you need more money coming from the government, basically. So to allow the Sports Commission, and the Sports Commission do a great job of um, distributing that money out to sport. Mm. And each federation, you know, the Cycling Federation, the Rowing Federation, they're charged with not only developing, um, supporting elite sport or their elite athletes, but also developing grassroots, developing the sport. And so the Sports Commission and the National Federations are trying, you know, they're all constantly trying to juggle that, that um, you know, where the funds will actually go. Mm. And is it something that only a government organisation could facilitate? You couldn't raise the amount of cash required through private equity? Well, you've... It'd be hard. Yeah. It'd be hard. I mean, the one way you could do it is through the lottery system. And you would know that basically Italian sport and British sport is funded through lottery systems. But unfortunately, Australia... Lotteries are controlled by the states, not federally. And uh, you try getting the states to agree on <laughs> distributing yeah. funds out of a lottery system. Like it's, it's been tried that many times. John tried it. Both Johns have tried it. Um, it's just, um, yeah, that's, that won't happen. Well, I hope it does happen, but I can't. It's been tried many times by yeah. pretty smart people. And it's frustrating too how successful it is overseas and how yeah. you see these other Absolutely. countries thriving off the back of probably not the best social, the best thing for society, but at least it, the cash flow is somewhere beneficial. Yeah, yeah. It may not, yes. They, well, it is beneficial for society because sport is funded better. Yeah. Yeah. The way um, it's derived, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you got to look at the bigger picture, Alex. You yeah. got to <laughs> take um, What's it like working for the other? So back to your John, John Coates. What's he like as a manager? He's been at the helm for a long time now. Oh, yeah, I, I, he's, he's great. I love him. Um, we got a, fa a fantastic relationship. He has been at the hel helmet the long, a long time, but he is so, he just understands the way it works. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, for a lot of that period that he's been president, he's been, it's sort of like the US model of president, of chairman and CEO. So the president and as well as, you know, running the organization. So, um, yeah, and just so, well, the thing that I love about him is that his heart is always with the athletes, just loves the athletes and tries to give them the best opportunity he possibly can and to run an organisation that allows that to happen. Mm. So, uh, you know, and he's changed over, over the years as well um, because you know, the world has changed. So um, no, he's, I reckon he's good. What's, what, what's his biggest asset? What, what, why is he... So good at it. He's just so connected within the Olympic movement. Um, so not only does he know pretty much everyone in sport in Australia and you know, links to government and, and um, media and uh, um, various uh, you know, elite businesses, but he's also, his linkage is back up into the IOC. Like he's a great friend of Thomas Bach's and great advisor of, of Thomas Bach, the president of the IOC. He knows, you know, he's been vice president um, of the IOC for many years. He's, you know, chairman of the Coordination Commission for Tokyo. So he's held in extremely high regard by the IOC and put, you know, charged with the responsibility of coming up with solutions for a whole lot of issues there. And so that, gives Australia a massive benefit to understand what the landscape is at the IOC and have direct linkage to the executive board and the president to discuss issues um, is a massive benefit for Australia. Mm. Back up a level to the IOC. What, what, are their, what are their major concerns at the moment? Uh, okay, so... Well, running a games in Tokyo, I think, is the major yeah. concern. <laughs> that is definitely front of mind. 
um, you know, to to postpone a game is uh, just incredible. Yeah, you know, you've just you've essentially you have to renegotiate every all of the venues, the Olympic Village. Uh, yeah, the Olympic Village it's it's pre-sold. It's a housing development that is pre-sold to the end user. So they've got to negotiate with the end user to, to extend that out for another year. Um, you know, hotels, transport, volunteer, an army, you know, 80,000 volunteers that are all keen as mustard, but they have to reorganize themselves. So that's a huge job. It's, all, it's not starting from scratch, but it's not far off. So to renegotiate that and uh, reorganize that for next year is um, is huge. Uh, the other issues, or well, not issues, but things that have been discussed are the, the role of e-games going forward. Um, a big one at the moment is the ability for athletes. You know, the beauty of the Olympic Games, there's no advertising hoarding anywhere within the venues. They're clean venues. Um, the athletes' uniforms are clean. It's got Australia and Adidas or Nike or whatever, the, that, but that's it. Um, and you don't, and the thing at the moment with the Black Lives Matter protests is that, you know, you, don't, you want to give athletes the ability to express themselves, but not on the start line of a race or on the podium that's going to distract and, um, you know, show a lot of disrespect for your fellow athletes. Um, so you, that's a real issue at the moment as well as giving athletes, you know, it's a basic human right to freedom of expression, but it's got to be in the right place at the right time. Mm. Out of respect for your fellow athletes. Mm. And yeah. What if Tokyo and then go- And then the, the next thing is, you know, the, the rights of the athletes to along the same lines, the rights of the athletes to promote themselves, to promote their sponsors during games time, which in the past has been, you know, it's been really hard and fast that you can't do that, but now that's softening as well. Yeah. What if Tokyo doesn't go ahead next year? Well, it'll be a massive, massive disappointment for everyone concerned. First and foremost, the athletes. I mean, one, they've, they've prepared for a Games that was, that was supposed to be happening in a month's time to wait another 13 months uh, from now to the next, you know, to the next opportunity. If, if it was cancelled, like, that, they would be shattered. You know, you, you, know, you, need, you need an endpoint. You need something to train for. Everyone needs something to train for. You can't just go out for a jog just for the hell of it. You need to, something to aim for whether it's a time or a fun run or whatever it is. So to not have that uh, would be so disappointing for the athletes. It would be incredibly disappointing for Tokyo. They are so pumped about hosting the games and all of the citizens. So yeah, it'd be, it'd be, uh, it'd be pretty tough. Mm. What, what about the financial element of it? Who loses? Uh, well, I think everyone loses. You know, the sport. So coming back to that funding model we were talking about before, you know, do you have the same amount of sponsors? There's been a huge, well, one, there's been a huge cost to the IOC in helping Tokyo with the, the um, postponement and, and putting it back a year. So there's a, a huge cost to the IOC. That means there's less money to go down to the sports. Um, and so the, the whole ecology and um, circular nature of the funding starts to break down if there's not as much money coming down to the NOCs, the, the National Olympic Committees, and the federations. And then you, you know, then you're going to be in discussions with your insurance insurers. Do they have insurance? You know, is there any recourse from the insurance companies about uh, the games not going ahead? Um, yeah, there's, a, and then Tokyo with. Their, their local sponsors and ticket sales and, and um, television rights and all of that sort of stuff. It's like, it's just a, as much as it's a huge amount of work to 
postpone the games a year, it would be a huge amount of work to then unwind all of the contractual um, aspects as well. Yeah. It wasn't going to go ahead. Do the ISC have insurance? I believe so, yes. Yes, they do. Yes, as I know they do. Now they do or they did? No, they did. They, they did. Like, yeah. it's a massive organisation. You're going to have insurance if something happens. Wow. Although this, this sporting world at the moment has shown that if if a small portion of their their season or their games come unstuck, they're in awful financial... Some of them are in awful financial trouble. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so that's... If that... Yeah, and that's why it's so important that... Um, yeah, those... Yeah, I mean, some just are going to really, really struggle. Um, and so if there's the funding from the IOC is diminished, that just exacerbates the problem. Mm. Are they concerned about selling, or I guess the, the trend of TV rights? There's talk of that we may have seen the biggest TV deals ever in the last couple of years from anywhere from the AFL to the global Olympic event. Is there concern that that's, that's the big ticket item, that that's the major part of their revenue? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, you want as diversified revenue stream as possible. And if it's all hanging on one item, that is an issue. And so that's why it's getting, um, um, you know, partners across all sorts of different fields. That's, uh, um, you know, the Olympic, there's an Olympic channel as well. It's, um, pumping out a whole lot of content all the time. Um, that's important to constantly engage with the community throughout the in between games to try and generate other revenue streams. So yeah, you, yeah, you want to have ideally you want to have a whole bunch of revenue streams that are all pretty equally equally weighted. And uh, yeah, you're right. Like the television rights of there has been some commentary to say, well, maybe maybe um, and television rights. Let's it's you know, the right to distribute digitally. It's not just on turn the telly on anymore. Mm. It's across all the different digital channels. Mm. Is, there, is there concern around just the global trend of sport and kind of the segmentation of things now and the, the fact that I guess the Olympics is still very unique in that it brings so many different sports together. Is there a concern around its attraction, its long-term I guess the, the continual growth of it. Well, it's a, it's a, you know, you competing against it's on one hand, it's, it's competition, but you know, it's the only event that brings the whole world together uh, now, which is, I think even more important given the sort of the global tensions we seem to be fragmenting more than coming together. So to have an event that actually does bring, um, the world together for uh, for one for for a reason for a purpose i think is is unique and it is the unique thing about the games mm. um so yeah i think it's i'm sure that, yeah they're concerned yeah there's always concerns but you're in a competitive landscape but it yeah. does have that incredible unique nature yeah one last question about the olympics the the other thing that is um kind of trending i guess through when you do your research on the different committees and what's going on is the host city like where next the attraction to new cities the actual um economic benefit that the olympics provides what what is the kind of the consensus on that level at the at the ioc and the aoc well, it's uh, yeah, the games are massive. So unless you use it as nation building, so some developing countries, you know, we've seen Asian countries recently use the games to build infrastructure. Um, that's a legacy. You know, I was, I was my first games was the Seoul Olympics in 1988, and I was back there last year for a, a conference, a sports conference, and I went to visit the um the olympic park area and i was blown away i was so pumped all the facilities are still being used there's people everywhere um i was on a weekend and there was people riding bikes and playing tennis and all of the all of the, the venues all of the, the stadiums were being used as well so 
there is that legacy aspect that's yeah you know, for the next thirty years, forty years. That um, same with Sydney out of the Homebush. Yeah, and Melbourne. I mean, look at the MC, You got the MCG. It's still that was pretty much built for the fifty six Olympics. Yeah. So there is that legacy component. So countries did use it as almost nation building of building all of that infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, the next few games, you know, we've got Tokyo, Paris, LA, um, big cities that see the benefit of building infrastructure for their communities. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, Brisbane 2032, Southeast Queensland looking to put a bid in. Which, put their hat um, in the ring. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's the same thing up there. You know, there's, I think between now and 2040, there's an estimated another 1.6 million people are going to be living Sunshine Coast down to the Gold Coast. And I don't know if you've been up there recently, but their infrastructure, <laughs> yeah, so, their roads are chockers already, let alone another 1.6 million people up there. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, it's just an excuse to, for the government to spend the infrastructure, the money that they actually yeah. need to spend. They, they need to spend it anyway. And here's a, here's a reason to just bring yeah. it forward. We probably uh, need another, we, we probably need another one here then too. <laughs> might even get it. Yeah, might unfortunately even get it. it's, uh, it's got to be in um, July, August. Yeah. And as a summer games, <laughs> It's not pretty, summer, pretty, yeah, pretty grim. <laughs> I guess the stand the the one that stands out is Rio, and the outcome of that. Do they? Yeah. How do they look back on that now? Well, that was. I mean, that was that was hard. That again, the IOC fund helped the Brazilians out a lot with funding and and staff. They sent. Yeah, a lot of the IOC management team across to Rio to help run the games. You know, Rio were awarded the games seven years. So they held the 2016. So seven years prior to 2016, they won the right to hold, host the games. And that was when the BRIC economies were thriving. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Going gangbusters. Iron ore was 120 bucks a tonne. Um, oil was, I don't know, 80 bucks a barrel. Brazil's got a lot of both. Uh, and they were flying. Seven years later, when the games were on, the iron ore price was about 20 bucks a tonne. And so they had gone from flying to basically bankrupt mm. right when the games were being held. And that was the major issue. Um, so uh, yeah, that was it. Was hard. It was really hard. Yeah. Does it? Is it, it make, to be a great? Yeah, it was a great games. It was a really good games. Yeah. I, I don't. I think. I think it was a good games in terms of the actual city itself, though. Does it? Does the IOC look back now on emerging markets like Brazil and go, maybe not? Is there too much risk now? Um. Yeah, they probably are. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's um, it's as opposed to a Tokyo, a Paris, a London, LA, you know, it's, it's You're pretty easier. confident. It's yeah, exactly. They've delivered events like that. Oh, they before. LA at the moment. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a long way off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit on to no, your, no, Alex, you're, you're right. There's always that challenge. You know, what is the benefit? Mm. Um, of hosting the games and uh, you know coming back to southeast Queensland one well tourism one is a massive benefit but also as I said it's a growing region not only infrastructure like road and rail but also just sporting halls sporting facilities more fields and parks for, for people to utilize mm. and that's the sort of benefit that gets left yeah yeah no, exactly. Um, your career. I'm not going to go, th we could do a whole other podcast on your career, but, I, but I'm interested in um, the moment that you thought that you were thinking about retiring, that you were thinking about what is life post rowing. Can you remember when that came about? Um, 
Well, I pretty much retired after each Olympics. But not seriously until after the last one. <laughs> Because uh, I always thought, yeah, there was more, there was more in me, and there was more opportunity. And going to the games is great fun, and you're doing it with some of your best mates and uh, representing the country, so it's pretty cool. But I think after the last one, you know, I was, I was married, three children, and I was well, I was forty. I turned forty three in Beijing at my last games, and. I thought physically, I you know, London was a chance physically. I could scrape in, but I didn't want it to just scrape in. You've got to be full bottle. You've got to be a hundred percent, especially in a team sport. You've got to be a hundred percent because you owe it to your teammates. They're doing the same thing because uh, they, you know, the amount of respect for one another. So I knew with, um, you know, with working, uh, three children, a wife, all of these, uh, you know, that's a massive part of, you know, it's two thirds of my life, essentially work and family. And the other third is sport. So you're not going to be able to, I wasn't going to be in a position to do a hundred percent towards sport. And so I, I didn't want to be in a situation of letting my teammates down, you know, sitting on the start line, start line thinking, shit, I've only given 95, you know, I've only devoted 95% to this where everyone else is hundred percent. I didn't want to be in that position at all. And so that's where I was like, right, I've had a good run. Um, I've had a great run. Uh, you know, let's, um, let's call it quits. And physically I probably was past it anyway. So yeah. <laughs> maybe I was just kidding myself. <laughs> it did, and did you like the, the incense, the sense of what next, the sense of where now, the sense of what do I do tomorrow when I'm all of a sudden not an athlete? Was there yeah. questions around that or was that just, not? Nah, I've got, you You had your degree. Was it just- Yeah, I had my degree and I was, I was worked all the way through as well. When I was in Australia, I was working all the way through as well. So uh, in financial, you know, you and I work in the same industry. So um, I was in financial services all the way through as well. So, so I had that dual career of, of doing sports, but also had um, good fallback, which made the whole transition far easier. And it's why, it's one of the things the AOC and the IOC are really pushing is dual career for current athletes mm. to have some you know, balance in their life. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I, I missed the, I really, really missed the single purpose. You know, just having something <laughs> massive to aim for. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, and even coming, I remember coming home from World Championships and you arrive back in Melbourne, you've come from European summer, you arrive back in Melbourne, take the dog for a walk and it's 12 degrees and drizzling and it's like, bloody hell, what now? What do I do now? <laughs> it's like, yeah, there is a void. It's a massive, ma you know what it's like. There's a, it's a massive, massive part of your life. And on one day it stops. And you've got to find ways to fill that void. Have you been able to feel, have you been able to find anything that big, anything that with that much aspiration to achieve? No, not really. Um, I've done some, I've got involved in a few other things. Like they've got to be, I think everyone needs something significant to aim for every couple of years and not like a one K fun run, which anyone can do, but something that you actually have to devote some time to, to train for. So, you know, it's just long runs, marathons, did an Ironman. Um, You've done an Ironman? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I'm going to paddle the Molokai surf ski. Oh, yeah? Race. Uh, it was supposed to be this year. So from one island in Hawaii to another island. So I sort of try and find things that I'm interested in uh, that are hard to do and that need a bit of time to be devoted. To yeah. There's, there's a lot of athletes though that have this kind of, this one this sense that I need one thing, I need to focus on this one direction, um, especially in cycling. It's, it's rife in cycling. But then the rollers come along and they're all like doctors and lawyers and done their finance degrees and they're studying in there. And they seem to train more than anyone. Like I don't think 
don't think many sports can argue that they train more than the rollers. What, what is it? Like, I know they just seem to get it. And it seems like that transition afterwards goes so much smoother for so many of them. Yeah. Well, I think, um, well, one, there's no dough in rowing, so you sort of have to work or do something to support yourself. Um, and yeah, and you're right. It does make the transition so much easier. But I think, uh, you know, if you've just got one, you just waste a lot of time if you're just focused on one thing. Like you go to training and you, you know, you spend a long time warming up and then you do your session and then it's, for you guys, it's, you know, 10 coffees afterwards, just chewing the fat and, you know, eating the croissant and then trying to vomit it up again. And <laughs> it's just like, you, know, you just, you just waste a lot of time. If you've got a day to do your training, you use the whole day. Um, so I think if you've got something else in your life, one, it, may, it stops you wasting the day. Uh, but two, mentally as well, like to be able to switch off from rowing and think about something else. And then at the end of the day, it's like, I'm sick of thinking about finance. I want to go rowing. So it, it actually benefits your training and your work because you're sort of looking forward to not thinking about that. I'm going to switch guns to over here and then vice versa. When you come back, you know, you're keen to get out of the office and get down to the river and go for a paddle. Um, so I think it's, there's a whole bunch of benefits and it gives you perspective. It's like your value isn't determined by how well you go at sport. You've got other things in your life that are value, equally valuable as valuable to you or your self-worth is based on. You know, yeah, it's you getting a degree, doing a TAFE course, getting out there working, doing some community stuff, helping disadvantaged people, whatever it is. But it gives you some purpose and that adds value. It's not just whether you win or lose on the bike or on the rowing, in the rowing boat. Mm. Um, you know, it's, I think that's super, super important. And that's where, you know, there's a lot of issues where people have been single focused on one thing and it hasn't worked out. They go through that period you described before of what next, there's nothing. And um, it's sort of a bit of a downward spiral from there, mm. or it can be a downward spiral. So balance is key. Yeah. I think, I think we might wrap things up on that, that wise piece of advice. <laughs> no, I, think, I, think, I think that is key. And thanks, James, for joining us on the podcast. Uh, I, hope, I hope you're on a flight to Tokyo. This time. So do I, mate. Next year. I hope you're able to watch the cycling. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Oh, 